Fundamentals of Philosophy series, read to you by Leslie, bestbookbits.com, A Contemporary Introduction to Free Will, by Robert Kane. Here's the brief. The discussion around free will isn't only a metaphysical discussion. In what ways are we free? Is it also a discussion of ethics? What kind of freedom is sufficient to confer moral responsibility? In fact, the latter discussion is so important that some have defined free will as that level of freedom which makes it meaningful and coherent to confer responsibility. The compatibilists believe that free will and moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. Classical compatibilists like Hobbes and Mill, believe that an absence of external constraints is free will, while new compatibilists require the lack of internal constraints, example, mental disorders, and for actions to be checked by a reflective system in the psyche. Compatibilists are looking for types of causation that would make an agent responsible but they are also hard pressed when asked how someone can be responsible for an action from a causation that was originally out of their control. The hard determinist reject compatibilism and think that determinism is true and that free will does not exist, i.e. there are no coherent ways to talk about responsibility. The main argument between this school and the compatibilists is whether life would lose some significant meaning of determinism if it were true. Some hard determinists would say that many things like desires and hopes would remain intact, but intuitions like praise or blameworthiness would be incoherent. The liberationists reject compatibility and think that free will does exist. They usually have to appeal to some form of mysticism but their position is convincing if they reject reductionism. Some liberarians believe that to be responsible, one needs a freedom of self-formation. To determine the character at a given point with you as the ultimate cause, instead of the compatibilist position, which is content on conferring responsibility to actions done out of a character, even if that character constitution is totally out of your control. Summary. Number one, introduction. And sub number one, all actions are caused. Sub number two, human actions are free. Sub number three, no caused action can be free. We must reject one of these premises. Rejecting one makes you a lib libertarian. Rejecting. Two, makes you a hard determinist. Rejecting three, makes you a compatibilist. The discussion of free will actually contains two inquiries. Firstly, it contains a metaphysical inquiry. In what ways are we free? Secondly, it contains an ethical inquiry. Given these freedoms, how should we live life? And do we have a moral responsibility? The hard determinist and the compatibilist do not have metaphysical disagreements, but rather ethical disagreements. Both of these have metaphysical disagreements with a libertarian. Although modern scholars sometimes forego the question of freedom and go straight to responsibility. In that sense, the hard determinist and the compatibilist can have metaphysical disagreements based on the mechanisms that create responsibility. We will first broadly examine the five types of freedoms and then explore the three different positions one can take. Number two, five freedoms, and number two, one, self-realization. The freedom of self-realization, the power or ability to do what we want to do, which entails an absence of external constraints or impediments preventing us from realizing our wants and purposes in action. This is a compatibilist freedom. It is compatible with determination. Therefore, few would argue that this is the only freedom worth having. It includes most of the freedom we care about in the socio-political domain. 
The freedom of self-realization includes all these social and political freedoms we are so that we so highly value. Freedom to speak our minds with our fear, to associate with whom we please, freedom from arbitrary search and seizure, freedom to vote and participate in the political process without intimidation, and so on. Such freedoms from external constraint are essential to our conception of human rights and to the very definition of free society. 2.2. Reflective self-control. The freedom of reflective or rational self-control, the power to understand and reflectively evaluate the reasons and motives one wants to act upon or should act upon, and to control one's behavior in accordance with such reflective considered reasons. This is a compatibilist freedom. Structurally, it is the freedom of a highly different part of ourselves to examine and change other parts of ourselves. In this literature, there is described, for example, a second order desires, desire for a desire, taming our first order desires of our values, reason, taming our desires. This is important because this is the lowest level of desire at which point moral responsibility can be arguably take effect. Some compatibilists believe that if a being has this capacity, they can be held morally responsible for their actions. Another criteria many compatibilists have is for a person to not only examine what consciously takes responsibility for their higher part of themselves. In self-realization, it is freedom from external impediments. Then reflective self-control is freedom from internal impediments, for example, mental issues. 2.3. Self-perfection. The freedom of self-perfection the power to understand and appreciate the right reasons for action and to guide one's behavior in accordance with the right reasons. This is a compatibilist freedom. This freedom is identical to the freedom of reflective self-control, except that it is now the access to the good which determines whether you are free and responsible. So even if you have the capacity to change your first order desires through your second order desires, you still aren't responsible if you never got access to the good in your development. This is a positive Kantlian notion of freedom because it is freedom in restraining oneself, freedom through limiting one's options and aligning to a standard. This is also a very professional freedom in the same manner that faith can only come through grace. Freedom can only come through given access to the good. 2.4, self-determination and self-formation. The freedom of self-determination, the power or ability to act your own free will in the sense of a will, character, motives, and purposes of your own making, a will that you yourself, to some degree, were ultimately responsible for forming. The freedom of self-formation, the power to form one's own will in a manner that is undetermined by one's past by virtue of waiting or self-forming actions over which one has plural, plural voluntary control. Essentially, compatibilists would think that self-determination is important, but not a qualitatively different freedom, and it can be reduced to the first three. Freedom of self-determination is important, and compatibilists will argue that it can be interpreted in terms of one or more of the first three comp compatibilist freedoms, most likely, for example, as a combination of self-realization and reflective self-control. To be self-determining, they might say, is to be able to determine one's actions in terms of the real or deep self with which one identifies or to which one is wholeheartedly committed. Or it is to be able to control one's desires in terms of one's reason or values, as well as being able to do what one wants without hindrances or impediments. Compatibilists, on the other hand, believe that in order for you to truly be responsible for an action, you can't have this deep self be determined on some external force. You must truly be ultimately responsible. Both compatibilists and incompatibilists think that the further freedom of self-determination is important for free will. But compatibilists would like to reduce the freedom of self-determination to one or another of the first three compatibilist freedoms, 
while incompatibilists insisted the freedom of self-determination must be extended beyond the first three freedoms in the fifth freedom of self-formation to account for genuine free will and responsibility. Question. It seems like the real disagreement here is whether self-determination through a deterministic process is enough to confer responsibility. Is responsibility the only thing at stake here? The author mentioned praiseworthiness, blameworthiness, but all of this seems to collapse into responsibility. In the mind of the incompatibilist, which is lost when we lose self-formation other than responsibility. Answer. People's interest in freedom is twofold. Number one, for a metaphysical possibility for alternate outcomes, they want to know if the world branches out in its decisions. Number two, moral responsibility, although some would argue that responsibility is so fundamental to who we are as rational beings that by shaking the pillar of moral responsibility, the whole edifice of human behavior would collapse. Free will and responsibility, 2.5. Most of the concern around free will is centered around the discussion of moral responsibility. Indeed, one may be interested in the discussion for other motives, theological divine knowledge, metaphysical branching of the world. Responsibility is so central to the decision of free will that some define free will, as opposed to other types of freedom, as that which is enough to confer responsibility. In the current literature, there are mostly two groups here. The first libertarian position believes that you need the principle of alternative possibility, PAP, to have genuine responsibility. In this hierarchy, this would be self-formation. The second compatibilist position believes that you only need reflective self-control. Lastly, the hard determinists usually do not believe that any notion of responsibility can be coherent. Number three, compatibilism, 3.1. Classical compatibilism. Classical compatibilism is the view that free will is simply freedom of self-realization that is the lack of external impediments. Hobbes and Mill were prominent classical compatibilists. Question, when someone says free will is X, do you mean that X is the only type of freedom out of the five freedoms? that we have or that X is enough to confer moral responsibility. So we can even need to discuss other freedoms, even if we have them. Clearly classical compatibilism should think we have freedom to reflect self-control, right? Answer, most philosophers would say that if your elucidation of free will does not contain some form of moral responsibility, then you have deeply failed in some regard it won't be an interesting notion of free will. So most philosophers, at least in moder modernity, simply say that X is enough to confer moral responsibility. Question, why is freedom interested outside of responsibility? Answer, people can be interested in it for either an understanding of metaphysics, how open is the world, or even for th theology about the possibility of divine foreknowledge. To the critique that this isn't enough and we need a freedom to have done otherwise, the compatibilist gives two responses. Number one, our view supports this freedom. You should have done otherwise had you wanted to do otherwise. Number two, if you wanted something deeper that is both incoherent and undesirable, you need to make an important decision. Marry A or B. How can you possibly experience the same events, go through the same train of thought, and conclude otherwise? And why is that all desirable? Number three, if you want an action that is uncaused, then you will, have, you will not have moral responsibility. It is the fact that your action is caused by your character that you should be held responsible. Obvious critique is that our characters are caused as well. Question. This does seem like quite a revelation of libertarianism. Why would you want, plausibly, not desirably, the freedom to do otherwise? It seems arbitrary and random. How would the libertarian respond? Answer. A libertarian would respond that the ability to do otherwise, independent of reason, is quite silly. For example, for Kant, it would be a choice of accordance with reason 
or with desire that is the alternative. We must clarify a few common misunderstandings. Number one, determinism cause is not the same as constraint. Just because something is caused doesn't mean it necessarily constrains you, just as the natural laws don't constrain, but rather propel the locomotive moving forward. Only certain types of causation are constraints, impediments. The fact that our characters are caused and causes a good thing because that means that tied to reality in some way. That causation might be more complex and sophisticated like the learning of a neural net. Determinism does not imply fatalism. Fatalism is the view that whatever is going to happen is going to happen no matter what I do. But this is not true. Whatever we end up doing is going to affect the future to a great deal. Indeed, everything is determined by causes, but our volition, desires, thoughts are causes themselves, and the future would be quite different depending on what we do. If anything, it is the determinist rather than the libertarian who has more agency, at least with respect to changing one's character, because the determinists believe that character is caused and can be changed whereas the libertarian takes a more unchangeable view. Determinism, Mill is saying, does not imply that we have no influence on how things turn out, including the molding of our characters. We obviously do have such an influence, and determinism alone does not rule it out. Believing in fatalism, by contrast, can have fatal consequences. A sick man may excuse himself for not seeing a doctor saying, if your time is up, it doesn't matter what you do about it. Or a soldier may use a familiar line for not taking precautions. There's a bullet out there with your name on it. When it comes, you will not be able to avoid it no matter what you do. Mill is saying that such fatalist claims do not follow merely from determinism. To think they do is a grand error. The claims of the sick man and the soldier are in fact examples of what the ancient philosophers called the lazy sophism. Sophism meaning a fallacy of reasoning. The proper answers to the sick man and the soldier would be, whether your time is now up may depend in great part on whether you see a doctor and whether any bullet out there is right, has your name on it, may depend on what precautions you take. So instead of sitting around doing nothing, see a doctor and take precautions. This is the response in that compatibilists such as Mill would give to the lazy sophism. Believing that determinism is compatible with freedom, they would say, should not make you a fatalist. Indeed, this belief should convince you that your life is to some extent in your own hands, since how you deliberate can still make a difference in your future, even if determinism should turn out to be true. Three. Determinism does not make us robots. We are built differently. We have emotions. We have consciousness. We have feelings. All of these can be caused. 3.2, new compatibilism. New compatibilists claim that classical compatibilism is deficient because it only gives us an overview of freedom and action, not freedom of will. They only talk about physical rather than mental constraints. Freedom of will is always defined as an ability to introspect and examine oneself, be it in the form of second-order desires or values. Question. It seems that the compatibilist inevitably run, runs into a problem. They think you are free when you are X, but the process of obtaining X may be determined since you are not free before X freedom is like faith in Christianity, and X may be determined itself. The compatibilist is then forced to answer the question of why someone ought to be held responsible for X, something that was ultimately outside of their control. Answer. The compatibilist would say that it doesn't matter that X was conditioned, that they are concerned with finding the causes that would consider to be responsible. They would say that as long as someone's reflective system, however it may be, define checks your actions and values, then you ought to be held responsible for them. They are going to bite the bullet and would satisfy, be satisfied with that definition. Number four, hard determinism. 
Modern hard determinists hold these premises as true. One, free will and determinism are incompatible. Two, free will of the libertarian kind does not exist. Three, either determinism or indeterminism, random chance events may be true. Number one, you do what you do because of the way you are, your nature or your character. Two, to be truly responsible for what you do, you must tr be truly responsible for the way you are, for your nature or character. Number three, but to the truly responsible for the way you are, you must have done something in the past for which you were responsible to make yourself, at least in part, the way you are. Number four, but if you're truly responsible for doing something in the past to make yourself what you are now, you must have been responsible for the way you were then, for your nature or character at this earlier point. Number five, but to have been responsible for the way you were, at least in an earlier time, you must have done something for which you were responsible at a still earlier time to make yourself the way you were at the earlier time, and so on backwards. Number 4.1. Consequence of Hard Determination The main debate between compatibilist and hard determinists is whether life would lose some significant meaning if determinism is true. The latter would say yes, Many of your capacities, dreams, and fears remain unchanged, but we can no longer hold blame and praise to anyone, including ourselves. We can still find certain actions admirable or despicable, but someone can no longer be praiseworthy or blameworthy. We may still hope for things and try for certain things because we simply do not know what is determined and what is not. Desires to become a successful actor, dancer, or writer, to start a business, to find love, to have children, to be admired by others. These hopes that give meaning to the life would not be undermined by the belief that we are not the originating causes of our own characters. What these everyday life hopes require is only that if we make the appropriate voluntary efforts, there is a good chance that nothing will prevent us from realizing our cherished goals. Even if our own behavior is determined, we cannot know in advance how things are destined to turn out. So we must go on trying to realize our life hopes and dreams in the same manner as we would if we did believe we had free will in the incompatible sense, though in fact, we do not. In our legal system, we no longer punish because it is deserved. We only punish for reformation and deterrence. But some do not share such a rosy view and believe that people must believe in the illusion of free will lest our moral boundaries collapse. We must be able to blame others and ourselves. Question, what are the consequences of not believing in free will on a societal level? Will we become more compassionate, caring, or more devious and selfish? Answer. There are arguments for all sides. We must become more compassionate. We can become more selfish. We can lose the nature of our very being. Number five, libertarianism. Libertarians hold these positions. Number one, free will and determination is not compatible. Number two, free will exists. Number three, determinism is false. The world is indeterminate i.e. there are uncaused events. Libertarians face the trouble of having to explain how it is possible that free will can be compatible with an indeterminate world. Most rely on positing some form of mystic identity. The nominal realm, an external soul, an eternal soul. They usually posit some immaterial substance, but they are forced into explaining how they can be uncaused causes to which they respond, they will simply do not know and appeal to mystery. The greatest criticism to libertarian notion of free will is that we can't make sense of it without appealing to mystery. A great 20th century physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, once said something relevant to this point. At the price of mystery, he said, you can have anything, though he might add in the worlds of Bertrand Russell that you give it too easily, acquiring it by theft rather than honest toil. 
but perhaps a convincing argument for the plausibility, but not actually of the libertarian position is this. Number one, even within our current system of science, we know that the deterministic view of the universe is likely to be outdated by quantum mechanics, so the world is likely to be indeterminate. Number two, the very presupposition to think about a reality through the lens of science is a reductionist perspective, and reductionism may very well not be true. The minute interactions we conceive in our particles, this Newtonian causality may be just a useful mental model to conceive of the world, but not capture it all in all its complexity. The most reasonable position of libertarianism grounds one's free will in the form of rationality. Some can take on the position that the ability to infer from P to Q is a fundamentally irreducible and different type of causality than is that of the Newtonian objects. They can then ground responsibility in the act of reason, and this is how they arrive at responsibility. The libertarian does not view this as appealing to mysticism. Instead, he takes a very Kantian position to tackle this and try to convince of a new form of causality on the atomic scale is a doomed project because it is possible that our facilities of reasoning are irreducible. Perhaps we fundamentally cannot know what, the, what science is. We know so little about the world, so it is the hard determinist who is jumping the gun on the conclusion. Number six, conclusion, how ought I act? How ought I act given the plausibility of hard determinism and libertarianism? Fortunately, the addition of my Buddhist ethics makes one operate very similarly with both of these metaphysics. A key concern with hard determinism is that we are viewed as automa and not worthy with inherent dignity that comes from the ability to set ends. But Buddhism is more concerned with the relief of suffering of all sentient beings. Determinism doesn't change the nature of suffering at all, so the core of the Buddhist project is left untouched. Furthermore, the threat of compassion from Buddhism is in perfect alignment with the idea of determined sentient beings tugged along for a ride of suffering from causality. Libertarianism may confer us moral responsibility, thus praise and blameworthiness, but Buddhist commands for unconditional compassion and love, which overrides that. Practically, a Buddhist would not punish beyond deterrence and habituation anyways, no matter the metaphysics. Buddhist ethics overrides the main difference between those two metaphysical positions having or not having moral responsibility through its emphasis on compassion. Since these two metaphysical positions leaves most other human tendencies intact, the addition of Buddhist ethics tells us to act in almost identical ways.